This will be my last letter for a long while. The Queen needs me more than the city does, and I need her. When she looks at me, she does not see an invalid, or a madwoman, or a burden. She sees a hunter. She has pointed me at the true enemy, and with her help, I will see my quarry caught. Welcome back, Guardians. Today, I wanted to summarize everything we know about Eris Morn in preparation for Shadowkeep. This was a monstrous video to make, so if you enjoy the video, please be sure to leave a like. As usual, the artwork featured at the beginning of this video was provided by Gamma Trap. All Patreon donations go towards paying Gamma Trap for the artwork. A Patreon link is below, as is Gamma Trap's YouTube, Twitch, and Twitter. I don't take anything from Patreon, but if you would like to support me, memberships are available with their own unique rewards. Click the join button or the link in the description. This is Mylan Games and I hope you enjoy this latest Destiny 2 lore episode. Let's begin. It is common to start Eris Morn's story with the battle for the moon, i.e. the Great Disaster and Crota's first fire team, which is a team that Eris Morn and Ariana 3 assembled to take on Crota. However, I want to describe two lore events that chronologically occur before the encounter with Crota. The first thing I want to talk about is Eris's childhood. Eris's origins was first described in the Truth to Power lore book, where the narrator of the Truth to Power lore book tried to convince Guardians that she was in fact Eris Morn. The narrator claims that her pre-guardian name was Arisia and she grew up in St. Petersburg. The Is It You law entry reads, In my first life I was born Arisia Poyatova Sien. I remember that private life clearly now, as ex-guardians who have escaped the traveller's occlusion often do. I lived in St. Petersburg, first daughter of a second marriage a very impatient child of Earth's 22nd century, often abandoned by my family who were called by work to Jakarta, Kamchatka and Lagos, to pass my days swimming in the icy Neva Bay. Most believe that this is of course a lie, Eris is not really trying to communicate with us and this is all part of Savathun's trickery. However, with that being said, we didn't know if there was an element of truth in this lie i.e. did Eris really grow up in St. Petersburg? With the release of Season of the Drifter, the law book Stolen Intelligence debunked the Truth to Power law entry and provided more details on Eris's childhood. The report claims to have personally spoken with Eris Morn in the field, who denies communicating with Guardians. In addition, the report provides evidence that Eris was born in the last city, not in St. Petersburg. The forgery's law entry reads, in these messages, the sender briefly purports to be none other than 1ERI223, providing fanciful details regarding her origins as a human woman who grew up in an apparent settlement of old Russia known as St. Petersburg. None of this account sat well with anyone who actually knows ERI223, not simply because none of her close confederates had any first-hand knowledge or belief that she knew of her pre-Guardian origins but also because she is still active in the field and has personally denied sending these messages. That being said, in accordance with our rigor for skeptical inquiry, this agent was dispatched in pursuit of hard evidence to the contrary. I submit to you now photographic and video evidence recovered from civilian family albums, historical archives and extant ghost recordings originally captured in the last city. Behold ERI-223, a child of the last city, born to civilian parents in a mortal guardian integrated neighborhood. So, if this evidence and report is correct, Eris was born to civilian parents in the last city, meaning the collapse has already occurred, guardians already exist, and this means Eris died post-collapse as an adult and then was resurrected by a ghost who had not yet been partnered. So that was one of the events I wanted to describe before getting to the Great Disaster, Eris's childhood. The second event, which in my opinion is the single most important part of Eris Morn's story, is the Great Ahamkara Hunt, 
If Eris did not participate in the great Ahamkara hunt, it is likely that she would not be around today. The great Ahamkara hunt was a coordinated effort to destroy every Ahamkara, every wish dragon. The Ahamkara basically act like genies, making bargains and granting wishes with guardians, and their abilities were considered too tempting and powerful to even exist, so the vanguard ordered their extinction. Eris Morn, now a guardian, assisted in the hunting of the Ahamkara. Have a listen to this lore entry where Eris Morn and Akora Ray wipe out an entire Ahamkara army and then vaporize their bones with the storm. The Strides of the Great Hunt reads, Eris and Akora stood over a graveyard of whispering bones. An hour ago, this was a vibrant army of Ahamkara. What did they offer you? said Eris. Her stare reached for a mile in front of them, so did the grave of bones. The same as you, I'm sure. Akora stood buoyed by a gentle flow of light above the whispering bones. It was easier to concentrate up here. Everything they say is true, said Eris. Akora looked down at her sharply. Sentiment like that leads to morbid places, she cautioned. Yes, came the reply. If you guide your light north, I'll take the south. This will be quick. I think they showed me my life before my ghost. Eris, focus. Yes. Together the guardians summoned a storm of light that consumed the bones around them. They ignored the whispers, but the voices grew louder, harsher, as a maelstrom progressed. Soon they couldn't tell the difference between the whispers and the storm. Now, there is a very good reason to why Eris and Akora tried to vaporize the Ahamkara bones, and that is because the Ahamkara's influence and abilities can continue through their remains. An Ahamkara bone can still grant wishes. The communication from Ahamkara bones or remains, tempting guardians to make a wish, are often described as whispers. Take, for example, when Eris Morn is hunting Ahamkara with Wei Ning. After destroying six Ahamkara, they begin to hear whispers. The law tab Vest of the Great Hunt reads, An hour later, six shapes emerge from the Venusian foliage, Ahamkara. Their compatriot, whom Wei Ning continued to pound into the ground, was pulsating, growing stronger, feeding. The others had come to feast at the same table. Eris pulled her arc blade from the air and blinked. When the hunter and the titan finished their hunt, Eris thought she heard Wei Ning whisper. Did you say something? I was about to ask you. Huh. Now, why is this important to know? Why is it important to know that Eris Morn participated in the Ahamkara hunt? Well, the reason why Eris Morn has three eyes, why Eris Morn cries black sludge, is because she made a wish using an Ahamkara bone. I'm going to explain the great disaster very shortly and also the first fire team, but essentially Eris Morn got trapped in the hive hellmouth. She was being drained of her light, her ghost was dead, and all her teammates had been destroyed by the hive. Her last option to escape the hellmouth was to make a wish using an Ahamkara bone. The cloak of the great hunt reads, I am lost in these lunar tunnels, out of ammo, short on light. I'm out of moves, save one. I clutch an Ahamkara bone in one hand and my dead ghost in the other. I hear a whisper. My vision is gone, my face itches from the viscous flow from my eyes. Though I can't see, I find that I suddenly know the way out. This was huge news when this Lord Tab was released in Forsaken, as we never knew how Eris escaped the Hellmouth, and we never knew how she got her dark powers. So although I have not specifically read any lore entry that details Eris stealing or stashing an Ahamkara bone during the Ahamkara hunt, I assume that because she was so heavily involved with hunting the Ahamkara, she couldn't resist stashing an Ahamkara bone, a bone that would later save her life, but also make her an outcast. Remember that the Ahamkara manipulate wishes, and even though we don't know exactly what Eris wished for, the Ahamkara gave her the ability to find her way out of the Hellmouth, but in doing so, it made her look like the Hive, made her look like the enemy, gave her multiple eyes and her dark aura. This in turn would make other Guardians and even some of the Vanguard shun her and describe her appearance as a sickness or disease. 
So whilst Amkara saved her life, she would be forced to live as an outcast. So now we have spoken about Eris Morn's childhood and her participating in the Amkara hunt where she likely gathered and stashed an Amkara bone. Let's move on to the Great Disaster. The Hive were using the moon as a platform to build their armies to launch an invasion on Earth. The Vanguard, despite barely securing a victory at Burning Lake, decided that they needed to preemptively clear the Hive from the moon. Thousands of Guardians joined the attack, but they found themselves outmatched by Crota, Oryx's son. The Grimoire card, Crota's End, reads, My name is Ariana III, disciple of the Praxic Warlocks marked by the Cormorant Seal, survivor of the Great Disaster. The day we set out to retake our moon, united in a host of thousands, and found ourselves outmatched by one Hive champion of unspeakable power. The monster's name is Crota. He killed my friends face to face, one by one, and he relished it. In the name of all those lost, I devote myself to his utter destruction. To give you an example of Crota's brutality, have a listen to how Crota killed some of the Guardians. In this case, Ariana 3 is trying to gain intelligence on how to kill Crota by torturing a wizard, and the wizard shows Ariana 3 a vision of Guardians being killed by Crota. The Ghost Fragment Warlock 2 reads, My name is Ariana 3, disciple of the Praxic Warlocks, marked by the Cormorant Seal. We came here under one banner, united in a host of thousands, to claim the moon, but the battle goes against us. I have taken a prisoner, and this is a record of its interrogation. If I transgress in your eyes, I ask for your forgiveness. Tell me how to kill Crota. Static event. It showed me the battle. It showed me waning dead on Crota's blade. It showed me how Crota killed the Guardian with a screaming knife hammered out of his own ghost. So I will take a piece of its mind and ask again. Tell me how to kill Crota. Now, this scene is pretty significant because Wei Ning is actually the partner of Ariana 3. So this wizard in her defiance during the interrogation showed Ariana 3, her partner, being killed by Crota, dead on his blade. So we got absolutely stomped at the moon. So why did Crota not immediately invade and destroy humanity? Well. Oryx recalled Crota to plan their final invasion and victory over Earth. The Oryx rebuked Grimoire card reads, When Crota's victory over our little blue world seemed certain, a moment of silence now for Wei Ning, whose directness I admired, it was Oryx who called his child back into the netherworld to plan final victory. It was Oryx that the violence of his spawn was tithed. So Crota is recalled by Oryx following the high victory and this gives Ariana 3 time to assemble a fire team with Eris Morn. Their objective is to identify how to defeat Crota, kill Crota, or the very least prevent Crota from being summoned to our world. To achieve this, Eris Morn and Ariana 3 first recruited Toland the Shattered due to his knowledge of the Hive. Toland would inform them through riddles that they would need to access Crota's throne world to destroy him. Ariana 3, Eris Morn, and Toland would then recruit Oma Agar, Saimoda, and Veltalo. The Crota's End Grimoire card reads, In our world, Crota seemed invincible. Together, Eris Morn and I worked the problem, but found no hope. So we sought forbidden knowledge. The exiled master of Hive Arcana. We found Toland. Toland tells us that Crota's presence in our world is a shadow, that its true power resides in a netherworld forged by his will. We must pass through a keyhole between realities, navigate the seething midnight of Crota's world mind, and overthrow the ascendant champions that gather to his throne. Tomorrow I will ask Agar, Mota, and Talo if they will go with us. If we fail, I leave this record for Guardians to come. Remember us. So the first Crota fire team need to descend into the Hellmouth, pass through the keyhole between realities to enter Crota's throne world and destroy him. They had a couple of other missions, such as destroying this summoning crystal and also preventing Omnigal from raising an army. Regardless of their objective, most of you know this mission was extremely unsuccessful. 
Tolan encountered Iayurt and was killed when learning the Death Singer's song. The Grimoire card Iayurt, the Death Singer, reads, I too am detached from my source. The charming Iayurt made her introductions and I was very pleased to meet her. We had a conversation, a little tete yurt, a couple old wizards exchanging definitions. I defined myself a friend, she defined for me the quiddity of death, and she sang the song of that fearful autonomy. Revelation, my friends, it does go down hard. The definition killed me, the killing redefined me. Toland, whilst physically dead, would return on the Dreadnought and in Forsaken as a guiding white light. Omar Agar suffered a horrible death in the Hellmouth as he is tortured by a hive wizard and her spawn. The light is ripped from his body. The Heart of Crota Grimoire card reads, I thought Omar dead until I heard his screams. I followed them down to the darkest night of the caverns below. What I saw, I witnessed all will fear. The villainy of the hive on full display. Among a sea of cocoons and surrounded by thousands more freshly spawned hordes, the heart held Omer's broken body in a vice of bone and pain. She was peeling the light from his body. How? I can't imagine. I have tried. Tendrils of luminous tore away like flesh. With every strand, Omer's scream cut the dark and was met with a chittering chorus from the unborn. I can't say if they were feeding off the light itself or the pain, but my guess is both. Somehow, both. The death of Ariana 3 is less specific, with her light just fading out within the Hellmouth. The ghost fragment, the Hellmouth 2, reads, My ghost light is so dim. There's no point following me further into this fog. Any hope of raising me died halfway through the stills. I only hope she's got strength enough to take this ember to where you fell, to dance once more with any last whisper of your own light left on this cursed, broken rock. Again, I will confess, I am Ariana 3 of the Practic Fire. I know my flame goes out down here. I'll burn bright and hot and raise a thousand hive to ash as I go. But I know we will not end him, the one who fell you and hundreds more with that foul blade. Vel Talo, the Titan's fate, is also less defined. Some will argue he was killed by the Darkblade Alakul because the Darkblade helm reads, Alakul, the Darkblade is laid low, and thus Vel Talo is avenged, Eris Morn. However, the Sunless Cell mission actually says that Alakul was there when the Crota fire team died, not that he specifically killed Vel Talo. The Enemy of My Enemy mission also says that Vel Talo underestimated the thrall. Regardless who delivered the final blow, Veltalo died within the Hellmouth. Lastly, Saimoda was killed by Omnigal. The acolyte rung flavor text reads, Moda was so close, clawing her way out with bones torn from the acolytes. Her fall, Omnigal. You honor her, Eris. As Saimoda charged towards Omnigal, her last words were, My knives are eager for another dance. Have a listen to the hand of Crota Grimoire card. It reads, This is Ariana III of the Praxic Warlocks, marked by the Cormorant Seal. I'm alongside the hunter Saimota. Our light is nearly gone. The ash of untold hive covers the ground in our wake. Inaudible scream. Omnigal. From what Tolan has described, we are on the path of Crota's dreaded hand. The hand is falling back toward the screams beyond these tunnels. Screw it. You ready? My knives are eager for another dance. You speak little, Saimota, but always say the right things. So, Ariana 3, Vel Talo, Saimota, Oma Agar are all dead. Toland is technically dead, and that leaves us only with Eris Morn. Of course, you already know now how Eris escapes the Hellmouth. She had an Aham Karabone, made a wish, and escape the Hellmouth. With Eris escaping the Hellmouth, we can now move on to the first DLC, The Dark Below. Eris Morn returns to the tower with mixed reception and informs you of Crota's resummoning to the moon and invasion of Earth. We stop the Hive ritual aimed at resurrecting Crota back to the moon. Now, this concept of summoning the Hive to our realm with crystals, I really don't know much about. 
I don't know if more has been added in the law about what is required to summon hive gods to our reality, but but the campaign in the dark below had us destroy a crystal on the moon which was intended to summon Crota. After stopping the summoning ritual, you join a team of guardians to enter Crota's end raid and destroy Crota in his throne world so that he may never be summoned again. Eris Morn is involved in guiding us to enact revenge upon Crota. Now we move on to the events of the Taken King. The marketing campaign for Taken King was misleading and oversimplified. It was often said that Oryx was coming for revenge for Guardians killing his son Crota, but within the lore, this is not really that accurate. Remember, Oryx threw Crota through a Vex portal because he accidentally let the Vex into his throne world, basically saying, go die or become stronger. Killing is different for the Hive, and if anything, Oryx wanted to face Earth and Guardians not because we killed Crota, but because we proved our strength in the universe. The Taken King campaign opens with Marasov narrating her own death when the Awoken are battling Oryx. The final line of the cutscene is Guide them, my hidden friend. Guide them, my hidden friend was a reference to Eris Morn because she was a member of the Hidden, a secret group of Guardian spies. Mara says it's all up to you, my hidden friend, because Eris Morn and Queen Marasov had developed a plan to claim Oryx's throne world. The birth of this collaboration begins in the Ghost Fragment, The Queen 2 Grimmel card, where Eris Morn visits Marasov with Osiris. Eris Morn warns Marasov of Oryx. It reads, I have no wish to play politics. I have no grievance with the city, not anymore. I have no grand hopes to end the war. For long I have known, I will not see its end. I am here for one battle and one alone, because it is a battle we must all fight, together or separately. So I will warn the defenders together or separately. I will do anything, her low voice shook with passion, to end Oryx. A silence rang out in the room. The hunter kept her head raised, her ambiguous gaze directed at the shadows in the throne where the queen reclined. Then a small smile curved the queen's lips. Well said. She straightened and leaned slightly forward so the room's light fell on her face. So let us end him. So, Marasov and Eris Morn agreed to work together to defeat Oryx, but what was the plan? The plan was only revealed when Destiny 2 Forsaken was released. Marasov's plan was to be intentionally killed by Oryx and enter Oryx's throne world. Eris Morn was then to aid and instruct Guardians in killing Oryx, and when his throne became vacant, Marasov could claim the Taken throne and powers. The reason why Marasov didn't just die and was transported into Oryx's Ascendant Realm is because of the weapon he used against the Awoken Fleet. The weapon itself pushes his throne world into reality and so being killed by it would normally take his enemies. However, Marasov survives. One of the reasons why Marasov survives is due to her creation as an Awoken, as she survived the Singularity, the Wormhole and her sheer will. In addition, the Harbingers may have assisted Marasov entering Oryx's throne world. Have a listen to what Tyrannicide 5 says. She feels her Techians preparing emergency self-gates. Shurichi reaches out to her, a wordless, urgent need for Mara to live. And it takes all the cold and passive remove of Mara's millennia to turn that hand away. The shockwave strikes. Mara dies. In one way, she is vaporized with her catch, the bonds between the very particles of her body questioned by the harrowing logic of Oryx's weapon and found inessential. The mechanism of devastation is spontaneous fission. The author of devastation is laughing in joy. In another way, a more true and symbolic way, she is impaled on Oryx's blade. She has thrown all her might at him, and he has answered. He has snuffed her fledgling divinity, and her meagre claim to royalty. He has exposed Mara to the raw and caustic hostility of his high war. She has been defeated by the sword logic. She dances down the blade and steps into his throne world. The harbingers give her the gate, and she takes the step. She is dead, consumed by Oryx. She is dead in his will, his ascendant realm. There was no other way inside except this true way. 
Anana at least gave her people some warning. She told her minister to have her worshippers lament, drum, pray, and lacerate their buttocks. Anana told her ministers to beg the gods to save her. Mara has not. Instead, she has enlisted Eris and several million mad dancing guardians to go knock off the god who killed her. It is, on that level, a very simple bank heist. Get yourself taken into the treasury as treasure, and when the owner dies, break back out with his stuff. Oryx's throne world tries to tear her body and psyche into quintillion screaming pieces, but Mara has survived the Intuit primordial chaos before space and time. She has retained her selfhood through far worse than this, and she has the patience for eons. Eris will succeed, the Guardians will play their part. When the power in this world is free for the taking, Mara will take it, not as a victor taking spoils, but as a scavenger takes a prize component for her masterwork. So this was all part of the plan. Eris was meant to guide Guardians to defeating Oryx so that Marasov could claim his throne world. Of course, in the Taking King campaign, that is exactly what we do. We enter Oryx's throne world upon the Dreadnought and defeat Oryx. Eris Morn doesn't stop there, but would go on to assist Guardians in fabricating the Touch of Malice. The Touch of Malice was crafted from the remnants of Oryx and his lieutenants, the Blade of Famine from the Warpriest, the Shroud of Eonuk from the Deathsingers, and the Ravenous Heart from Oryx himself. It is said that through creating the Touch of Malice, Oryx lives on through the weapon, and we continue to shape the perfect universe through death and destruction. Even though Eris helps us fabricate the weapon, the in-game dialogue makes it very clear that the creation of Touch of Malice was a Guardian choice. Guardians chose to make it, Eris just assisted. After Eris has assisted in the defeat of Oryx and the creation of Touch of Malice, she leaves the tower. Eris claims to her good friend Ashamia that she must leave in order to pursue the Hive. Most suspect Eris is pursuing Savathun, Oryx's sister. Ashamir is currently infected by the Vex and unconscious in a medical facility. Whilst by his side, Eris says this. Soon I will take my leave of this. She puts her hands up to take in the med bay, the city, the tower, earth. Lie. I must find a new path through the night. The hive are vast and ancient, a power from far beyond our realm. If we are ever truly to face them, ever truly to put an end to their hate, I must step beyond the safety of the city. Now this is not the last correspondence we have with Eris. If you remember to the beginning of this video, I spoke about how they contacted Eris in the field to confirm if she was sending the transmissions to Guardians in the Truth to Power law book. So someone has been in contact with Eris. In addition, Eris Morn sends a letter back to Ashamir explaining that she is still working with the Queen, which I assume is a reference to Queen Mara Solve, not Savathun. The law entry Unfinal Shapes reads, Mine is not a final shape. She showed me that. Eris Morn. Asha. I took a slew of hive chitin with my own hands. I bent it into the shape of a starship. I think you of all people might understand why but it's more than just a reminder of the green flames behind my brow. Asha, I saw a throne world built for the light, built with darkness of course, and the bitter logic of swords, but built for light. It made me wonder, this will be my last letter for a long while. The queen needs me more than the city does, and I need her. When she looks at me, she does not see an invalid, or a madwoman, or a burden. She sees a hunter. She has pointed me at the true enemy, and with her help, I will see my quarry caught. Clarity in action. Eris Morn. And I believe that this is the last correspondence we have with Eris Morn. And with that, that is everything I know about Eris Morn, which should bring you up to date before the next DLC, Shadowkeep. If you enjoyed this video and managed to make it this far, a like would be super appreciated. And if you'd like to support the channel and cannot think of a comment, you can leave the word Whisper which represents the Ahamkara Whispers and how Eris Morn escaped the Hellmouth. As usual, it has been a pleasure. This is Marlon Games. Peace.